Introducing a lineup of international award-winning and talented indie authors, only on the Writers' Corner live show. In today's episode of the Writers' Corner live show, we dive into the psyche of horror with Momo Shati. She's a writer, a lecturer, and producer. She unveils the secrets behind the latest anthology, Love the sinner and discusses the intersection of psychology and storytelling don't go away we'll be right back with the writer's corner live show welcome to the writer's corner live show the weekly water cooler for authors and readers join us for 30 minutes of insightful conversation with some of the biggest names in the industry we feature award-winning authors new york times and usa today bestsellers and even international indie sensations. Tune in and join our family-friendly community only on the Writer's Corner live show. If you have just joined us, then welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. If you're not following us yet, please do so that you'll get notified the next time we go live. I'm your host, Bridgetti Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa, and my co-host, Mary, will join us next time. Today's show, we're going to be talking to Mo Mashati. Mo, if you have not met her before, is a horror writer, a lecturer and producer who brings a very unique twist to the genre as a cognitive behavioral therapist. And as a lecturer, she delves into the deep psychological aspects of horror. She produced the 13 Minutes of Horror Film Fest for women identifying creatives, forging partnerships with industry giants such as the Shudder Channel. In collaboration with Stowe Story Labs, their fellowship supports women in horror over 40. In her latest work that we were talking about today, Love the Sinner explores the consequence, consequences of sins in a distorted and deadly landscape. Lisa Kroger describes it as a chilling anthology that unravels the twisted reality of the human psyche, proving that man is the scariest monster. So without any further ado, let's invite Mo to join me, shall we? Mo, welcome. Thanks very much for joining me on the Writer's Corner live show. I am so delighted that you could uh, join me today. Perfect. No, I'm excited. This is great. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. We always love, or I never get tired of interviewing authors. Mary and I have been doing this for six years, and every author's journey is so different and so unique that every week we look forward to the show just to find out what the backstory is of the author and the book and why they write and how they write. So I'm going to jump right into it. Sure. And ask you what sparked your journey into horror writing and could you share a moment or experience that ignited your passion for crafting such amazing chilling tales? Wow. I mean, I, I think no writer is going to say that it didn't start when they were very, very young. I mean, everyone's always said, I've always loved writing. I've always done this. Um, for me, it was just being a latchkey kid. Um, I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but latchkey kids usually were left to fend for themselves. Their adults were working full time or going to school at night. I was the youngest of three um, daughters. And uh, my mother worked full time and went to night school um, in the late 70s, early 80s. So for me, it was really left to our own devices to play, to, you know, to, you know, create our own world, spend our own time together. We would play together and then we'd get very sick of each other and then we would go do our own things. So for me, it was definitely 
imagination, playing pretend. But I also got a hold of my eldest sister, who is 10 years older than me. I would always sneak her books because to me, she was the coolest person in the room. She was the oldest. She was getting out and living and doing a bunch of really cool things. Um, and her friends would always give her horror books to read. So I would always steal her her horror books as like, you know, seven or eight years old, um, reading these terrible books that I'm not supposed to be reading, like Stephen King. Um, Ray Bradbury is who I really gravitated towards very, very early on um, with his um, science fiction horror stories. So for me, it really started from there is really being so engrossed in these worlds and really allowing myself to feel that fear and be able to be scared and kind of reveling in that and wanting to continue the story. So falling in love with a lot of these characters and then writing my own, which is now called fan fiction, um, writing my own continuation of those stories um, from falling in love with those characters is what really got me into writing that type of genre very, very, very early. Um, and learning that maybe I should maybe not go places so dark as I learned getting into my, you know, grammar school, junior school writing classes where they're just like, we want to talk to you about your daughter's story. <laughs> You might want to talk to her about things. Um, and my mother had known that, you know, I'd, I'd had a big love of horror very early on. So that was the seeds of, of writing um, horror and, and science fiction very, very early in my life. Continued all the way through my college career and my creative writing courses. Um, and I've never really stopped. I've really just kind of lived in those two genres. I do write comedy for uh, screenwriting, but that's a, a whole different world to me, but I've never really strayed from writing sci-fi and horror from a very, very young age. That's amazing. I mean, I can, I can just imagine your teachers going, um, <laughs> I'd like to talk to your mom. You know, it's like, what's going on here? <laughs> right. Is your daughter okay? Um, yeah, no, hundred percent. A couple of meetings like that. So and there's like, can't you just write a happy story? I was like, but this is happy. It's great. Um, oh my goodness. If you yeah. could swap lives with a fictional horror character for a day, Ooh. who would it be and why? Swap lives with a fictional character. Wow. Um, honestly, it would probably be um, there is a story by um, now I have to narrow it down. Um, there's a story by um, Stephen King that he had written recently in a collection of stories. I've, I've always loved his short form as opposed to his novels. Not that his novels aren't absolutely amazing, but there's a short story he has um, in a collection called, um, oh God, it's, uh, it's not Dance Macabre. Oh, now everything's escaping me, but the story is called Mile 81, and it is about this young boy who has an older brother that he idolizes, um, which I kind of really related to very quickly as in idolizing my older sisters, but he is kind of being forced to hang out with the older brother, and the older brother kind of ditches him, loses him, and hangs out with his other friends, and while this child is exploring on his own, he stumbles upon this abandoned um, fast food joint. It's not you know, it's in disrepair. It's obviously home to squatters and things like that. And in the parking lot is this very um, abandoned, broken down, muddy looking car. And the car is kind of like, um, if you've read his story, Christine, where you have the haunted vehicle and things like that, um, is how this young boy deals with the vehicle and everybody that encounters this vehicle. Um, he watches what happens to them and definitely tries to help defeat them. And uh, it's just a really interesting story about how kids are, there's so many horror stories that are based on children um, being either the, the product of the evil or having to fight against it. And I've always been so excited to read stories of children who are basically like the meek shall inherit the earth kind of stories where they are the hero. Because I feel like even in horror, kids need to, to feel that they need to feel that they can 
they, they have control a little bit, you know, because we don't when we're kids. Our parents are the rulers. Our teachers are the rulers. We don't have a lot of opportunities to become the hero or save the world or, or be a voice. Yeah. Or be a voice. Or have a voice. In nature. And then this story, which I, I, it still really, really haunts me because it's just a child that is in charge of basically saving all the adults that don't listen to reason. Um, that think that they are going to be the ones that are going to solve the problem. And it, it's probably him. I can't think of what, like my mind is blanking. I can't think of what his name is, but the story is Mile 81 and probably the main protagonist from that story. I would probably, I would like to feel empowered in a way that I guess I didn't when I was was a kid because I was the youngest I wasn't necessarily bullied by my sisters or anything like that but I was always the one that was given the least credit to have a voice you know that to have input or or to to tell the stories that I was telling like this happened to me at school today and it was like oh you're exaggerating oh that this didn't happen like it was always being discounted and discounted I feel, yeah. yeah yeah and I feel like um I think I gravitated to that story very quickly because I was just like this kid has the power to change, literally change the world and what's happening around him. Um, Isn't it amazing how our childhood experiences uh, shape who we become? Oh, 100%. You know, in, in your adult lives. And I mean, I'm just listening to you now and how you felt that you, your voice was suppressed. And now, you know, in your writing, you can give expression to yourself mm -hmm. um, yeah. and give a voice and, and almost give permission to other children to have a voice um, as well, you know, just listening to how you recounting this. Do you have, have you had any um, inspiration that you've drawn from a unexpected or weird source in, you know, writing your horror stories? Yeah, um, I think that what's interesting to me is, is being that kind of hanging on to those moments that I had when I was a child and we were, we were alone and I don't want it to, to be like, you know, we were just <laughs> destitute and abandoned. We weren't, um, we were just, you know, in our own world and having that kind of freedom to, to be as, as wild and as crazy in my imagination, um, as a child that I don't think we, we give ourselves enough leeway to be, to be scared or to try or to, to go for things as an adult. I feel like we're so fearless as children um, and, and children aren't given as much credit with that because they're just like, Oh, it being a scaredy cat, you're being little. You're, of course you were scared because you were small, but I feel like we're so fearless as children. We'll try anything. I mean, as babies, we'll like, what is that? I want to eat it. I want to like experience this. I want to go here. I want to walk. And I feel like as adults, we get a little, little more fearful of life and we begin to fear more because we understand that there's stakes involved it's now. It's a learned experience. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, I think my inspiration from, for writing more horror, really just kind of sticking with it and really going for it is, is trying to, I guess, perpetually tell my young self that, you know, it's okay to be fearless. It's okay to keep going. It's okay to keep writing scary. It's okay to be dark because there's always, you know, there's always another side and it's okay that you're inspired by, you know, terrible things and terrible people, which is kind of hence where love the sinners idea came from. Um, but I think that it's for me, that inspiration is always just little me being unafraid to, to write scary, to do scary things, to try. Um, so I think I try to kind of honor that every, every time that I write. Oh, wow. Okay. So my next question for you is a fun one. If, if, if one of your horror stories were adapted to a sitcom, <laughs> who would you cast? I mean, that's everyone's dream, right? right? Who would you cast to play the quirky, unsuspecting neighbor that always wow. finds themselves entangled in supernatural chaos? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so funny. Oh man, um, geez, uh, there is. Uh, does it have to be from this book, or is, could be anything? No, it could be. It could be. It could be any one of your stories. Well, there is a, a story that I have coming out in a. I have a another book, which is a two volume uh, set coming out through uh, Spooky House Press next year. And there's a story where there is a neighbor um, who 
basically knocks at the most inopportune time. Um, and I think that that would be, you know, that that <laughs> the quirky neighbor would probably have to be, oh man, you know who I would, posthumously, I would love it to be Madeline Kahn, but it's not. Um, I think probably the neighbor would probably, this neighbor from the story would probably have to be Kate McKinnon. Um, she's from Saturday Night Live fame and Ghostbusters um, because of just of the deadpan timing and not knowing that they are number one is the worst time possible for you to be coming over here and then completely kind of glazing over the really horrific or supernatural things that are happening and just being like, oh, you know. Guess it's just how it is over here. Your life is so fun. Um, probably, probably came again. That's just I am thinking of the story. Cause in my head, I'm I'm cackling, but you have no idea what the story is. <laughs> oh my goodness. So love the sinner. Mm -hmm. Um, in each story, it explores the consequences of sins in a distorted landscape. Yes. And if you had to pick one sin from the anthology mm -hmm. that you would believe would make an entertaining game show challenge. Which sin would it be? And how would the contestants compete? Ooh. Um, I love this question because I think that probably one of the most insidious sins that there is, is pride. Um, and I think that for, for the game show, it would probably have to be, how would they, like, how would they compete? Like what would be the rules of the game show? Is what, that what, yeah. Yes. Um, I think pride is, I think it would have to be where people would, people are, we're, and I thought not really envy, but I think we're so proud of who we are and what our, our outward, not only our outward appearance, our attitude, but also how people kind people of consume by it. Yeah. yeah. Into a have or a have not. And I think that pride would have to be kind of giving, like chipping away, almost like a truth or dare or true or false. Like, is this how you really live? Did this really happen to you? how are you really feeling about this person? And I think it would really need to chip away how honest we are with ourselves. Um, that would be very interesting. Yeah. How honest are you with yourself? And not necessarily like on a lie detector aspect, but um, no. you know, whenever, who are you when nobody's watching you? Um, That's a very good know. one. But I, yeah. I think that pride is probably the worst, uh, <laughs> the most insidious in there is because we do things for as and I think that as we grow older even in our our teen aspect when we're you know we're formative and things are social and we're forming like friend groups and and then you know you have those clashes between you know friend breakups and you know you're trying to run with this pack and now these people don't like you I think it's we learn very early on um to perform for others um and to always remain Isn't that alive. sad yeah Isn't and that always, just sad and always remain liked for some reason um, or for the right reasons. So I think that, yeah, I think that would be a very, we would call it a game show, but it would be a very dramatic, very dramatic. It, I would. Think. it would indeed. It would indeed. Um, what would you say is one of the most fascinating or unusual research that you've had to do for your horror writing? Oh, gosh. Well, a lot of it really stems from my studies in behavioral science, um, especially for really the basis of what Love the Sinner is, that is that we're all guilty of all of these. We, we've all committed, all of us have committed all of these sins at one point or another to one degree or another. But it's in really the focus of how, as human beings, we will justify whatever we've had to do, whether it's caused harm to somebody or embarrassment or misery, or even, you know, in the long run harm to ourselves, we are able to justify all of those acts because of what we wanted at the time. 
like you go through researching even through like true crime and crimes of passion and it's like oh well this person you know had put a hit out on their spouse because they were in love with somebody else and didn't want to get divorced so they would rather just have this person completely eliminated and they could justify that because they wanted to start a new life or you know they had you know, someone fired from their job because they wanted their position and all they could see was the ambition there. And I'm justified. I'm more qualified. So I just have to eliminate this person. So we're, I think my, my research has just been how consistent that justification is throughout, you know, these types of sins like lust, like envy, like pride, um, you know, we'll do something to make somebody feel bad about themselves. So we feel better because we could justify that, you know, and it's across the board, even from really, you know, petty crimes, like, you know, like petty larceny, you know, stealing you know, bikes, cars, you know, things like that into, you know, actual crimes, violent crimes, things like that, that justification is so consistent across the board because all we could see was the end game. And that was enough. That was enough. I'm going to get that. Right. The like day. distorted reality. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get that. So whatever I have to do to get that is all I, that's all I care about. Um, and I think that that was probably research wise was the most concerning. <laughs> I think. As if, you know, it's almost as if everyone feels that the end justifies the means. Yep. As they say. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah. 100%. And that's what's, and like I said, the consistency is what was really the scary part for me because I was like, oh, well, surely, you know, something petty. Oh, I, you know, I, I stole your bike and, you know, X, Y, and Z. But even to where, you know, you have these violent things happening, people are still could, still could figure out, well, don't you understand? Like, this is why I did it. Like, doesn't it make sense why I would have done it? Or people will say, well, if you hadn't done X, I wouldn't have done Y. Shifting so, the blame, basically. Yeah, so it's always either a projection or it's a justification mm -hmm. and that never wavered throughout that whole process, which was really pretty scary. Very interesting. Very interesting yeah. um, study, you know, and, and something to really delve, delve into. Mm -hmm. So Love Thy Sinner takes readers into – a distorted and almost deadly landscape of human uh, psyche. Mm -hmm. If you were to create a quirky tagline for the book Ooh. that captures the essence of, in a humorous way, what would it be? A quirky tagline. <laughs> um, I would probably say... Um, Oh God, quirky. I can't think. I would probably say get ready to not like anyone in this book. <laughs> I mean, they're all, you know, they're not most. And that was an interesting thing with trying to pitch this book is that um, a lot of these characters, actually all of these characters are 100% relatable characters, but also 100% unlikable characters. Like you shouldn't be rooting for these people, but you can't help but find parts of yourself within them, which I think is such an interesting mirror um, for not only like the reader, because when you go in thinking like sins, oh, you know, there's, there's a religious aspect to it to a point. Um, but there's no devil in this book. There's no religion in this book. It's really just kind of like putting visually, I mean, visually my cover is, is, is a little bit of a misnomer on that, but I think that that is what people equate with, with sin is the religious aspect of it. But really the tag, the, the, the not so quirky tagline for the book is that man is the scariest monster. So it's really us we have to contend with and, and our internal workings that are, that are our worst enemy. Um, but quirky, I'd probably say, yeah, don't, don't plan on liking anybody in this book. Oh my goodness. You're not your friend. <laughs> Have you ever had a 
a funny or unexpected reaction to somebody reading one of your stories? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a friend of mine um, before I had actually finished the edits on this. I had had a friend of mine that um, is not in the literary world, which I always welcome because sometimes if you get in that vacuum, you kind of not necessarily lose um, your eye for certain things, but it's nice to have somebody that doesn't have any real weight um, to give you a really honest opinion on it. And there is a my story of of envy, which um, is called Free Weight, uh, started off as a screenplay, and um, it has now been elongated into a short story. And they had said, you know, I I that's probably my favorite story in the book. Why why is everybody you write such a jerk? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Just because people that are jerky might do bad things more often, I would assume. Um, but they were just like, ah, oh, they're just a jerk. Like, and they just couldn't get over like how how funny it was to. They're like the story was so good, but this character is just like, oh my god, this guy is just such a such a, a leech on humanity. Like they're just so like, why is the story so good when this person is so bad? Um, and it made me laugh because I was like, that's that's the reaction I want out of the story from, you know, from someone outside the bubble. But also like they just couldn't get over how they were just like, I don't think I've read something where I wasn't, you know, cheering somebody on or just like, oh, my gosh, are they going to make it? I'm so fearful for them. Like I'm really invested. And they like felt bad. <laughs> like, I feel bad about myself that I was invested in this person that is not a good person. And I was like, then that's my that's job done. <laughs> oh my job. goodness. Job done. Mo, do you do you have a copy of your book with you? I do. It's right here. Oh, do you want to hold it up? Oh, there we yeah. go. There we go. Get them out. Oh, it's a nice shiny cover. Who designed the cover for you? And did you have any input into that? I did. Um, the design for the oh my god, I'm gonna butcher the name. Um, their design for the cover um is I have to look up the design. Um I believe it was um, Elizabeth uh, Legette. And um, we really, really, really wanted to make sure that we had the point across of visually something that looked like death. Um, and we went through a few designs of, you know, is it this? Is it this? And some had a few, you know, some imagery that was like, yeah, I'm not really seeing it. Um, and then we landed on this and I was like, I feel like visually um, this is what people equate with with sin, which is like it, a, an old abandoned church. Um, you know, you've got the skull, you've got like the 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 veil of mourning. And as much as there is a spoiler, some death in the book. <laughs> Um, I think this is so representative of the stories that are in here because there's not just, you know, physical death in, in, in the book. There's also, you know, just, you know, emotional um, death, walking away from situations, walking away from things that are mentally taxing. Um, and I think those are the relatable pieces of the characters in the book that are really either stressed to the limit or super passionate about what they believe in and they're still not getting what they deserve or desire um, and having to work that out. And I, I love, I've fallen in love with it. I call it my little scully book because it's just, it just means it's, you know, books are your babies when you put them out. And I think that the, for me, this is so representative of the, um, scope of the book. So I'm really, really pleased with it. Oh, that's awesome. And just some advice for a new authors out there. Would you recommend having a publicist when you, when you're writing? I think if you're lucky enough to, um, cause not, I mean, especially the presses that you're, you're involved in some, some of us are self-publishing. Um, and if you have that leeway in, in your pocket to, to do that for publicists, some presses, um, uh, make them available to you. I think that they're really invaluable on the sect of you can, you can't do it alone unless you're a complete octopus <laughs> and have, you know, your arms and everything. Um, you really can't do it alone, especially being an indie uh, an indie author, you know, we're not all Peter Straubs, we're not all Stephen Kings that have 
you know, everybody knows who we are and they know once we put out something that they can go pick it up. Um, you do need the the support of, of someone, whether it be marketing or, or things uh, put together like podcasting and, and, and wonderful shows like this of, of this nature. Um, it's helpful. It really is helpful to, to get more people exposed to your work in all the avenues that you can. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more because I think, you know, sometimes or first time author maybe and is often under the illusion that, you know, you write your book, your baby's on the shelf and it's just going to sell itself, you know, but it couldn't it be not. further. <laughs> from it does, it does, you know, and until you become a well-known author, mm -hmm. it does take a lot of work. And I think that's where the one sees the value of having a good publicist um, because they've got the connections um they've got the network that can give you a leg up um mm -hmm. and really sort of help you set yourself apart um in the, in the marketplace yeah but 100 because it's difficult it's difficult out there i mean you you know getting on your socials and really stop don't stop tooting your own horn i mean that is something that i've learned over this last year is just being maybe too humble for what i'm trying to do is like, I don't want to talk about myself too much. I don't want to brag too much. But you really, you really have to um, be comfortable with being out there and kind of exposing your work as much as possible because no one's going to know it's out there if you don't, if you don't talk about it. So absolutely, and that's a good note to end on. Mo, thank you so much. It was lovely having you on the Writers Corner thank Live Show. We'd so love much. to have you back when you. When is your next book out? Um, should be early spring, April or May. Fantastic. We'd love to have you back again. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mo. And to our amazing audience out there, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'd love to see you on the next episode of the Writer's Corner Live Show. Take care and we'll chat soon. Thank you for joining us on the Writer's Corner Live Show. 30 minutes of insightful author conversations with some of the biggest names in the industry, including award-winning authors and international indie sensations. Join us on the next episode of the Writer's Corner live show.